Basically, it all started with the, with the Conan paperback cover in about 1965. The original book had a small fo cult following, and Conan in the book was basically had uh, blonde hair, leather jacket, and blue eyes, so it really wasn't a barbaric figure of any kind of a threat, so my dad did his impersonation of it. And that started the whole trend. It sold over 10 million copies, and it started from that spot. So, he was so influential back then, and that's still going to carry into nowadays. You know, you have young kids looking into fantasy art, type in fantasy art, I'm sure something will pop up of his, and it's very uh, appealing work. mainly started at, at seven or eight o'clock at night. When we went to bed, I was just a young boy, being five, six years old. And uh, if you look into it, uh, they did some research about it years ago, and they said anybody who's artistic or imaginative, has an imaginative mind, it really starts working in the evening. And that's why most artists always used to work through the night. If his art was done in one evening, two evenings at the most. And he'd start it, and like the Conan painting was done in two nights, and because he used so much of a mind power to, to actually do the process of painting it, when he was finished with it, he'd lay on the couch for like three days flat, face down, just because he used up so much of that mental energy to do it. My mom thought he was dead a few times. She wouldn't even wake up. <laughs> That's the truth. As he got older, things progressed more into afternoons, you know, when he was in his 40s and 50s and 60s. And uh, he listened to Sinatra during the afternoon, and at night he'd get into that classical music, Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Ball Mountain, things like that. And it's a big motivating factor when you listen to it. Because he taught me when I was young, and I'd put Billy Idol on, and my rock and roll, he'd come in the room and smack me in the back of the head, a love tap, and say, why are you listening to that crap? He goes, you can't, you can't create with that. And I said, that's good stuff. And he'd, bring, I, he'd leave the room, and I'd say, oh boy, here he comes back with Sinatra. And then he'd bring Rite of Spring in, which is very classical, used for Disney and Fantasia. And you could just, if you close your eyes, even people with, with little imagination would actually start seeing images of, by the sound. He, uh, you know, he was painting the Civil Warrior painting one afternoon, back in probably 1974 or three. And I was like 17, and we were very competitive in sports. And we'd play stickball every day. Before the museum was here, there was a backstop here for stickball. And he, uh, we'd go in there right in the middle of his painting. We weren't afraid to walk in his room. Like some people would lock the door and that would be it. He's isolated. Not my father. And I'd say, Pop, you want to play some tickball? <clears throat> yeah, I'll be right out. And he just, he'd be right in the middle of that painting. He'd sit there, clean his brush, turpentine it, wipe it off. And in a couple of minutes, he's right out. And he said, what was good about that is because he'd come back in an hour, two hours, and the painting would be fresh to him. He had a, a reducing glass in his hand, so when he looked at his art, it would shrink it down to see what it would look like on a paperback book. And he had a mirror that he constantly, when he was doing the art, he'd sit back and look like this over his shoulder to see the painting in reverse. And when you see something, there again, when you see it in reverse, it's like looking at it for the first time again. And if it's off balance or something's wrong with the painting, you'll pick it up immediately. My dad's influence was, art was, was in his soul, but so was baseball. He was extremely athletic, and he wanted to do baseball until I found out how little they would pay him. And he'd have to travel out west, you know, on a bus before he was drafted. Even though he was drafted by the New York Giants, he still would have to hit the minors for a while. And he was a homebody, never left Brooklyn. And that kind of turned him away from it. And then when he also thought about re-pursuing it, his friend just came back from the minors and he said he was a real husky guy, and he said he lost like 40 pounds just from the, the hustle and bustle and the drag of going out west and playing down in the south, so he, he gave up on that. He had, he had offers from Disney also to go out west when he was young, when he was doing the comic books. And there again, because it was, he was so much of a homebody, he, he turned that down also. Um, but, but, you know, and I asked him one time, I said, Dad, if you ever took up baseball for a career, I said, do you think we would all miss that on this stuff, this great art? And he said, he goes, I would have, it was so much in my blood, he said, I probably would have been doing all drawing during the bus rides and plane rides. I remember towards the, um, towards more the end of his life, he was asking me, you know, do you think I should have pursued baseball instead? Like, do you think the art was a good idea? I was like, Grandpa, you know, no offense to baseball players, they're very athletic. You can be raised to be a baseball player. You know, you can have natural talent too, 
But to be an artist, that's something that you can't exactly, you know, be into someone. It's just there or it's not. So I told him, you know, baseball would have been the wrong choice. Simple as that. And he wouldn't have been at his home as often. And he loved his family. It's the only thing he cared about. So it was good that he stayed with art. I mean, it's probably tens of thousands of drawings I've never seen. You know, he gave them away when he was little. He never valued them. But artists weren't valued in the 50s either. You know, the publisher kept your artwork. You know, they'd do a whole Sunday page for $30, $40, $50, and, and the art was given to the publisher. They never got it back. Mm. And my dad and my mother were the ones who actually started that, where the artist retained the artwork. He said he never put 100%, and he put like 30%, 40% in his art. And as soon as he retained his art, he, that's when the good stuff started coming out. He was, like I said, he was so gifted with imagination. And I, I, I was doing an article for my website last night. And the only way I could explain his process of warm up, if you may say it that way, uh, most people would sit there and, as, as an artist, and they'd, they'd sit there and work it with their hands. You'd see their arms kind of shape it, shape it. The only way I could explain it with my dad was he could project an invisible image through his mind, through his eyes, right onto the paper, and basically trace it with one line, like it was a perfectly drawn. A photograph or whatever underneath the, the blank piece of paper that he's drawing on and it was done it was just like it was like one outline on the outside that was done that was it he did too many rushs because he said why should i have to do it twice but there again because he was good enough to do that and fortunate enough actually and uh, he the deadlines was a part of him to keep his paintings loose too i said he was one of the probably the only person in history who could do one of these oil paintings in one night Every, most artists today take two three four weeks to do one but, but you look at the qualities of them, how loose they are, how, how flowing they are. There's, there's nothing there that's tight. I remember when I was like, I had to have been like five or six years old. And I was doing, I don't even know what I was drawing. He came over, that eye's bigger than the other one. It's like, oh, okay, redo it. That one's still bigger. It's like, damn it. So I have to sit there and keep redoing it over and over and over. And he wasn't trying to like upset me. He was just so used to being who he is that imperfections are just kind of get to him a bit. I think if anything, he would tell people to be themselves. You know, don't copy someone. It's different to have an influence, but it's. A completely different thing to blatantly copy what they're doing. Um, Defense, they would say, well, Mr. Frazetta, when I go into the office with my portfolio, they say, we want it to look like that. And then my dad's paintings are all around the office. My dad goes, yeah, but that's, they said that to me too. He goes, I told them to take a hike. I said, I'll do it my way or no way. That's why the Sinatra thing, I'll do it my way, that was basically my dad's motto too. But he, he was disappointed him when he said, I did it my, he goes, I just do it. And they, they just didn't understand. What do you mean, I just do it? He goes, I don't know how I do it. I just do it. And that's the truth. And like a Nike saying, he, he just did it. He didn't, he couldn't understand how or why. It just, it was there. And that's the truth. And he used Mickey Mouse paints too, by the way. <laughs> They're the most colorful and... Vibrant and bright, but he goes, I like the colors. The reds were more vibrant and the blues were really pop. And he said, I don't know if they're going to fall off the paper in five years because they're Mickey Mouse paints, but... It's still there. He did use the candy for an advantage. That was his motivation for, for like a speed. That was his, that was his speed. It were about three quarters of a cup of sugar with his coffee. When he was done with his coffee, they used to have the glass sugar, sugar jars. You probably were not old enough to even know it. They had a little flap on the end. And he'd sit there with his coffee, fill it up, and he'd go, he'd be coming out, I'm watching for 30 seconds. You see the coffee from half full come right to the top. He'd stir it up, 
then when he's done drinking it, right on the bottom is about an inch of undissolved sugar. And he just liked it sweet like candy. It was his speed. That got his mind racing.